lecture of the uh, spring lecture series, the last of the uh, academic year. We just had our last uh, academic council meeting, actually not the last, but we sort of acted like it was the last, saying how well we thought we've uh, dealt with all of the changes that we've gone through this semester especially, but uh, this year, moving from Santa Monica after 20 years to uh, the Welcome to the last lecture of the uh, spring lecture series, the last of the uh, academic year. We just had our last uh, academic council meeting, actually not the last, but we sort of acted like it was the last, saying how well we thought we've uh, dealt with all of the changes that we've gone through this semester especially, but uh, this year, moving from Santa Monica after 20 years to uh, this new facility. It's actually quite terrific to see people spread out in this space. Um, it somehow makes the move feel complete when the main space is filled up, the main space being um, geographically and symbolically the center of the school for years. And uh, so I think, once again, having it active is uh, important to all of us. Um, so welcome to all of you. The End of the uh, school year reviews are taking place now. They go through the uh, 1st of May. Um, any of the people here that aren't students that are interested in seeing the work, you're free to come. The schedule is going to be out on the table, um, where the, at the reception table outside. There's actually quite a, a variety of things that are going on in the school in uh, each of the uh, the departments, all of it, because of the size of the building, we're able to put more up here than we were at the other place. And once it goes up, it stays up for a longer period of time, so you'll be able to get a sampling of what's going on here. There's looks like there's still some remnants back there for a presentation that was in the main space today. Um, also, this Friday evening, um, every Friday night, the students put on a barbecue. They call it Fridays at 5. Um, since this is the last one for the academic year, this is a special one. Um, it, it also is going to be coupled with the presentation of one of the object-making classes that Randall Wilson led. It's a furniture class. I think it's called Soft Furniture. Um, one of the sort of sub-themes of the, uh, the semester was, uh, I don't know how it could be a theme, but we'll find out Friday night, was Elvis Presley. Uh, I'm wondering what it's going to be like, but in any case, there's going to be a band, uh, an Elvis impersonator called Elvez, that's going to be here. Uh, he's getting an honorary degree. The party is free, so please come. Um, also, Monday evening, we have a special lecture of... Um, it's going to be given by a, a man that's coming from Russia. Um, when we arranged it, he was coming from the Soviet Union, but now he's coming from Russia. His name is Anatoly Savin. He's the director of the Department for the Preservation of Historical and Cultural Monuments. When it was still the Soviet Union, he had under his charge the, the, uh, the, uh, the documentation and, and uh, the listing of 9,600 buildings in the entire Soviet Union. It's been reduced. Um, but not by much, because most of the buildings that were going to be preserved uh, were in the Russian Federation. He's going to be lecturing on the Moscow Kremlin Preservation, Restoration, and Research Works. It's Monday evening at 8 o'clock. It's also free. It's going to be happening here in the main space. I'd also like to thank, once again, the students and the faculty and Rosemary, who helps coordinate the lecture series for the, uh, the spring lecture series, which has had a difficult time um, because of the, the move. But I think it's uh, quite fitting that we end the lecture series now the way the, uh, the first one five years ago began with uh, Wolf Pricks from Coop Pimmelblau. Uh, I prefer to say Coop. Um, some little-known facts. I think everybody that's here knows him or knows the work. Um, 
so I wanted to speak more generally, except there's a, f a few specific facts that uh, Kopimoblau is 24 years old uh, this year. Um, if you work backwards, you could figure out his age. Um, also, some other facts. Under certain circumstances, I've, uh, um, this comes from personal experience of knowing Wolf, um, he's uh, easily disoriented. Um, sometimes he has a, a bad sense of direction. Um, he was asking where on the east side of town he could go get um, a drink in a bar that he would have never known existed, and so I told him of this little tropical building in Silver Lake called the Tiki Tai um, that makes the kind of drinks that after a couple of them you can't find your legs, um, but they taste so good you keep on drinking. Um, he found out, uh, he discovered a part of, of uh, Southern California that he wouldn't have discovered. He got on the 10 freeway thinking he was headed back out to the west side and ended up out in San Bernardino. Um, and didn't know it. Nothing was recognizable. He was looking, he was, for, he was trying to find the smell of the ocean. And that's how he found out that he wasn't in the right place. Um, I began to think about having a bad sense of direction. Once uh, I was told by a, a friend that worked for Alvaralto that the, the, uh, the buildings are Alto's aesthetic, which was always discussed um, in poetic terminology, was perhaps due to the fact that Alto drank a lot and couldn't draw straight lines. Um, I began to wonder if perhaps uh, Wolf's bad sense of direction um, led to the aesthetic of Koa Um But in any case, I think the, the broad influence that uh, the work of Koa Pimmelblau, which is Wolf, Pricks, uh, Helmut Schwazinski, and currently uh, in Los Angeles, heading up the Los Angeles office, uh, Frank Stepper, um, it's probably the first body of work whose influence doesn't come from any theoretical base or from some intellectual uh, uh, condition. It, it has to do with the fact that it, it looks good, it feels good, it smells good, and it tastes good. And liking it is primarily visceral. It's not to say that, it, that uh, theory can't be unfolded out of it and that there isn't any intellectual content because for sure there is. Um, another aspect, I think, in looking at the body of work, uh, which began in the 60s, which I think is a question that we have to continually ask, but I think especially these days, it's a question that we ask here at school when we're um, trying to figure out what motivates the current generation, as well as what motivates us, is what compels any of us to act. I think in various phases of our life, um, when you're young, it's an act of discovery. As you get older, it becomes an act of defining oneself, of self-identity, of reacting to the world around you, sometimes in a, in a very mean and tough way, sometimes in a very gentle and subtle way. Um, you then enter into, I think, at a point in your life where um, you realize that you're defined enough and you now have to test yourself against the world, and so you enter the public debate, proposing that the work that you do is an alternate reality to all of the others. And then ultimately, um, you reach a place in your life where other people not only believe your ideas, they trust you enough to give you the opportunity to build, which is the ultimate test of your ideas. I think the work of Himmelblau comes out of a great urge to just make things. Make them in a way that captures the intensity of the moment of conception, which I think is critical. The moment of conception, I think, as it's seen in the, uh, the drawings of the work and then the work itself, uh, is an event that's as, as primary as, I think, birth itself. And in, in, in astrophysics, it would be the Big Bang. Um, the one thing that I know from personal experience in, in, uh, in seeing the work is that it's one of the rare times when you can find architecture having a kind of embryonic quality where it's encoded with information that's carried first, forth from the, so the, the initial outburst. And what it, I think what's important is that it carries with it um, the power of the ideas that motivates and ultimately the power of ideas as they're expressed through architecture. And I think uh, also what's important in a few people's work these days, especially the work of Himmelblau, is that the work shows both in the making of it 
and in the experiencing of it, that architecture can be fun. The Wolfman. Leave the light on, please. Michael, thank you very much. I learned a lot. I didn't know that I'm 24 years old. And I didn't know that I drink too much. <laughs> um, of course we are disoriented. Uh, th that's the reason I'm here for. <laughs> uh, thanks. Actually, I expected Axel Rose will do the introduction. And, but I'm not disappointed, Michael. It was heavy intellectual. Um, I'm going to do an American lecture. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? I think there are two ways to describe an American lecture. Firstly, uh, the equipment will break down. <laughs> Last time I was here, it couldn't break down because the equipment was not here. Um, secondly, and I learned that by uh, watching a lot of famous lectures by famous people like Tom Main and Eric Moss and Stephen Hall, that before you start to show the slides, you have to give a kind of explanation of your theory. At least 10 minutes. <laughs> and actually, I saw, I saw um, Stephen Hall, famous Stephen Wonder Hall, lecturing here, and he, I counted his quotes his philosophical theoretical quotes, it was about 324 quotes. So when uh, I got the invitation, I have to do a lecture here, I, I got really nervous because um, I have to, to, to find a theory and I have to find quotes <laughs> uh, at least for 10 minutes. So I got really nervous and I started to read books. Goethe, <laughs> Shakespeare, uh, actually, Eric Moss did a lecture in Vienna and he started with uh, scientific theories, so geometric theories. So, so I thought, okay, what can I do? To be or not to be? Or <laughs> so I got a call from my son. I, I, I called the office and said, please send me a quote, a theoretical quote. <laughs> and Helmut called me back and said, we have none. So uh, my son called me from England. He's playing there rock and roll right now. And, and I said, do you have a quote? And, and he said, of course. Tell them uh, you should go down to Paradise City where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. <laughs> so, I des so I decided to do a lecture on rock and roll quotes like rollover architecture or give me shelter or I can't get no grades. Um, I like, actually, I like Guns N' Roses. <laughs> they, are, they are even better than the Rolling Stones. And not because of the similarity of appetite for destruction, but uh, they are really beautiful guys. <laughs> And uh, my son, my son tries to be Slash, yeah, you know? He bought the most expensive guitar, the Gibson guitar, black one, but he's blonde. So he uh, paints his hair <laughs> in order to look like Slash. But he has glasses. Anyway, um, this was um, about the American lecture. Quotes. There's another thing about theory. Theory, what could be a theory? Uh, the closest thing we could think is explain deconstructivist architecture uh, because the question will come. And so I, I went to Paris in order to get some idea about deconstructivist uh, philosophy is. And the, the guys really explained to me that we are real deconstructivists. Why? Okay, it's easy to explain. Um, you have to read Derrida, no one did, but you have to quote him, so I quote first quote. Um, 
you have to find the weakest point of the story. The weakest point, it reminds me of the weak forms of uh, Eisenman. Actually, he is doing great lectures. He's talking um, one hour and then he shows two slides. <laughs> He's talking about weak architecture, <laughs> which is actually a German uh, uh, word game. Um, one of these guys explained me, uh, and because he wrote about us, that in order to a question a system of theory, a qu to question the system of thinking, you have to find the weakest point of this system in order to change it. And he proved that we are doing this, uh, the same way of designing. I, I don't believe him and therefore once again we, we have no theory. So uh, another quote may be, give me shelter. Uh, but we have a strategy or we have a kind of concept. Because the concept of our thinking is that, uh, that architecture will be the art of the next century. This is a theory, you could say. And how to prove, okay? The mayor of Vienna proved it for us. He told us that he has to cancel our major theater project in Vienna because uh, he said, you can frighten people the most with doing, by doing modern architecture. So that's the proof for that architecture is the art of the next century because art doesn't provoke anyone nowadays. You can see the, the, the ugliest paint, images and painting on the wall of the dining room, Kiefer, for instance. But no one is afraid of, no one fe feel, uh, feels um, uh, concerned. But if you do modern architecture, they hate you. <laughs> anyway, we have to live with that and we lived, um, as I learned, uh, for 24 years. So in order to get a theoretical lecture <laughs> out of this evening, I sampled seven topics. Listen, first, look, uh, sounds good, the cloud as a feedback machine. Second, the leaping whale. Third, mutation and transformation. Fourth, surgery on the box. And then the power of the city. There are two missing, but this will be a surprise. Can I have the first two slides? A quote which beats, obviously, Danny Libeskind. Because on the left side you can see Lisitsky, L. Lisitsky. And on the right side you see the two members of Himmelblau. And if you enlarge the shadow, it will form a capital A, which is, of course, the first letter of architecture. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Danny will be very jealous if he, if he first heard that. Up from now, the Mars has three moons. Uh, Eric starts the, 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 the lecture with explaining that the two moons of Mars uh, reversed all the scientific thinking because the two uh, moons are doing quite the opposite what the science calculated. So uh, in order to have two moons and a little one, uh, um, I just arranged our team photo this way. Next. Uh, the cloud is a feedback machine. This was the first project we did and we call it cloud. It was a pneumatic uh, environment. Watch out. Air as, an, as, as a structural member was very important at this, at this time. Next. And inside this um, environment there were feedback machines which means 
light is changed, light, sound, and colors are changed by people which had uh, heart beating machines and face uh, helmets. Next. So that uh, the, the, the space could react to the mood and attitude of the people. For instance, this, um, this uh, machine on the left image is a machine who translates face motion which into colors. And on the right, uh, right image, you can see the heart transformation machine, which, uh, which is a machine uh, which have had a heart micro, which transforms the heartbeat into light and sound. Next. So you can see that uh, architecture and body has for us a close relationship. And this is a performance we called Heart Space because explosion set, uh, explosion set was triggered by our heartbeats. And I can tell you it was a great experience to see that your heartbeat can ignite um, uh, explosion in, in, in a very heavy uh, um, explosion. Next. Before I start to tell what a leaping whale is for us, I have to explain where the name comes from, Himmelblau. Um, when we started to, be, uh, to form the team, it was 68. Uh, you know, at this time, not only architecture exploded, but there was a lot of music around. And we decided to, that we want to be as rich and famous as the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Therefore, we had to have a team name. Briggs and Swierczynski would have been very boring, so we decided to, uh, to have an equal name, like Rolling Stones or Cream. You know Cream? Uh, sitting on the top of the world, White Room. Great architectural songs. Uh, anyway, uh, we didn't succeed in, in, in being uh, rich and famous like Rolling Stones, but we kept the name. And Himmelblau in, in English means sky blue. But sky blue for us was not a color. It was rather the idea of having architectural buoyant and changeable like clouds. How to get to the, uh, such kind of architecture? I think the process of designing is a very important one. And I like to compare the process of, of, of designing with uh, the, 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 the performance of a leaping whale. Why? Uh, this mammal is changing in media, uh, is changing from water into air. And as you can see, you have to imagine 13 tons start to fly. And you can see this mammal had fun by flying, floating in the air for seconds only. And this is the moment you have to catch. Not as, like a whale catcher, but, but in architecture, of course. This is the moment where, where your thoughts coming up from the unconscious into conscious, you have to pick it and pin it and draw it. And then maybe you got the moment of, like the Spanish guy says, the Toreros or says, the moment of truth. Uh, I don't know whether there is truth, but uh, we like to say that, that uh, everyone is correct, but nothing is correct. Everyone is right, but nothing is correct. So, but this process, uh, how to catch this uh, feeling in architecture. Actually, we want to build a feeling. Not we. We don't want to build buildings. We want to build feelings, and therefore our next our drawings are not architectural drawings, as you can see, hopefully soon. Next, please. Uh, they are not architectural drawings, but rather the psychograms of the upcoming space we would like to build. And in the last couple of years, we tried to condense this actual moment of designing. In order to exclude everything which could uh, let us uh, lead away from architecture, from space like uh, circumstantial pressures, constraints like money, clients, uh, programs, 
We care uh, structure. It's not interest. Uh, we are not interested in the moment of designing. We had to avoid to think in architecture because if you think in architecture, only architecture will come out. And this is the way today anyway. Uh, the people are looking in encyclopedia to find architecture. This is not the way to um, to get in the front of a, of a thought. I think avant, to be avant-garde nowadays is a little bit of blame, but we still insist that architecture has to be avant-garde, otherwise it's a static and not a dynamic procedure. So this drawings are rather imprints of the upcoming space like imprints of the foot in, a, in, the, in the sand of a beach and but they are very important for us because this drawing for us uh, holds all the things we need for later structure program and codes next How does it work? Helmut and I, and now Frank, we don't uh, talk about the project, about the function too, too much. We, circ uh, we just circle the problem. And then there is a very, in a very quick moment, there is a sketch. Sometimes on the paper, sometimes on the table, sometimes even on the wall or the floor, wherever. At the same time, there is a model. And this is the moment of conception. We trust that from this point of departure, architecture could come free. And in the last two to five years, we, we, we figured out that Helmut and I, we don't talk too much anymore. We just show what we think we have to build. So the body language, the body and architecture, the connection is here again, but the body language is uh, the first sketch for us in this case, uh, the, the Paris Milan Senar city competition next, and the better model, for instance, for this theater project we won in Vienna. Next. Uh, we, we train ourselves to do this kind of de uh, designing procedure by doing, by doing a lot of installation, a lot of quotation mark art pieces for galleries and museum. And in, in 82, we did it uh, without compromising our way of thinking in a very straightforward way. So we did a sketch and we did a model. And when we saw the model, uh, we thought, it's so ugly. We have to build it. Next. <laughs> and we did it. And w what, uh, what did we learn? We learned that uh, we can build ugly things. Actually, this is a theoretical point about aesthetics. When we did the things 10 years, 15 years ago, every critic blamed us for being so ugly. Now we had a, an exhibition at the Kuhlenschmidt Gallery and famous Aaron Batsky came to us and said, hey, you guys, your projects are much too beautiful. So see how the aesthetic issues <laughs> are changing? The times they are changing. Another quote, next. <laughs> and uh, we did a lot of these things in order to get self-confidence that we can do this very specific and I, th I would say a very unique way. This is, of course, a very artistic approach to architecture. I think art, and this uh, closes the, the circle, art is much more complex than architecture. The approach to art, like, like the cubism, the invention of cubism, is much more complex than the architecture, which was at the same time, because it includes psychological issues as well. Not complexity is the topic of the next century, I think. So therefore, this approach, this very artistic approach, uh, doesn't bother us, because I think we can get out some complexity we would never, ever get out if we would think only in a straightforward architectural way. 
Next. The key project of this way of designing is the open house. Uh, I make it short, everyone hopefully knows it. If not, I don't worry. <laughs> uh, we had a client, he wanted to, uh, want to have a house, but he didn't know what he really wanted. So we talked to him a very long time, and, and in order to get his emotional needs rather than uh, his functional needs. So, and then the house was there, not as a house, but as a feeling. Um, we, we, we couldn't see the details, and I couldn't see the, 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 the architectural pieces, but I could feel how it is to step inside this house. And all I did was I took a pencil, closed my eyes, and used the pencil and the fingers as a seismograph, which draws, drew this emotional zigzag of the way through the house. At the same time, Helmut did the model, which is small, like a matchbox, but if you compare the drawing and the model, it's everything fits, or almost fits. Next. Uh, of course, you have to develop such ideas in a very straightforward way, especially structure-wise. So, uh, to, in order to get this floating feeling in architecture, because just to tell that this thing will float is boring. It has to float. If you say, as an architect, it floats, it has to float. However, so therefore we try to catch this feeling also in structure. So, and our structural engineer calls it that we, uh, we are doing a mixture between a bridge and an airplane, which is actually uh, a mixture between open and closed systems. Next. And this is something about virtual reality, because uh, everyone who's, who saw this uh, image thought that the house is built. And there are guys who come to LA in order to, to see the house, and all they c c can see is just a small image. Next. Uh, the more we train ourselves to do it, the more sophisticated the pro procedure gets. Uh, for instance, a drawing for, for a uh, studio for a graphic artist in Vienna, and compare the drawing with the, with the isometric drawing, the freehand drawing with the isometric drawing. You can see that every line is, uh, which is on the drawing is built and has a meaning, not only a spatial meaning, but also a structural one. Next. And this is the way how it looks in reality. So to prove that we can build what we draw is our, was our main concern 10 years, 15 years ago. Next. Because no one believed us, of course. Uh, the older we get, the more, <laughs> the more clever we get, of course. Uh, so we invented another procedure how to translate this uh, rather complicated uh, models into reality. What we did, uh, or what we do now is, we, uh, this is an example for this procedure, uh, we photo, uh, photogrammet, we do a pho photogrammetry from this object. Means every spatial point can be fixed, and then where the computer is coming into our job, it can be plot. Next. The strategy of, of our work is very close to uh, form mutation and transformation. Means how to get next, how to get the box into something else. And this procedure we call surgery on the box. In 75, we started to, to work on this surgery by next. By, by introducing some elements, like, for instance, an arrow and a, and, a, and a wing. And the third element we used at this time, and we still use, is the arch, is the bow. Uh, you can see that on the, 
and, the, and this installation architecture is now where the, this, uh, this guardrail uh, arches through the space. Next. And starts, it starts with a simple beam penetrating a building. And the wing-shaped uh, glass roof covers the courtyard. Next. This beam starts to slant two years later. This project, it was an addition to an old house, a school building. And later on in 87, it sits on top of a roof and changes from the top the whole building. Next. Uh, the, the wing, the, 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 the flame, actually the, 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 the blazing wing, the, the, the burning wing for us is the paradigm for, 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 for a form mutation. And in order to see how we can work with that, we did another performance creating a, a 15 ton steel structure which burned uh, at least 15 minutes long. Next. This wing uh, comes reality in a very early project of ours, the Red Angel, which is a bar and a performance space in Vienna. Next. And where, and this is the project where the wing and the slanted beam uh, comes together. It, this is an apartment complex uh, loft. 50 lofts are planned. It's still not built, but we insist that maybe it will be built. Next. Uh, this, this beam now, and this is very recently as you can read, uh, this is in an, an office building in Germany. This beam is still slanting, but now we introduce an, another, another uh, element. For, no, it's not formal, it's, it's, it's not, not even formalistic. It's just another voca vocabulary. This is an X. In between this X, the, 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 the beam is suspended, and where it seemingly breaks, the, uh, where it seemingly break, there is the entrance. Next. This X comes to an element with, uh, 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 which supports a part of a factory, will be finished. This factory is on site and will be finished, I think, in one month. And now this X starts to be a beam again, and creating space for, for a house in Malibu, which hopefully will be very soon on site. I promise it will be soon on site. Because we, we really want to see it next. Next, please. I think this is very important as well, that we always want to see our, our things immediately after we draw it. And it's very hard for us to make this uh, monkey business which is in between. But, uh, but in order to get these things built, you have to do it. Monkey business, therefore, because you know, you have to, in architecture, you have to deal with weight, with tons of weight. That means you have to deal with money. And where money and weight comes together, there is power. So, uh, and there, of course, are all these politicians. And these are actually my friends. Uh, uh, actually, the title of this lecture is Exile on Main Street because we always miss these guys a little bit. Yeah, I want to, if we want to be friendly, they are not here. And then we are angry at them and then they listen. And now they are angry at us. So <laughs> anyway, so this is another uh, project we are doing uh, in, in Austria. This is a house. Uh, which offers another explanation how we design. We always support the thinner part. Is there a yeah. Look, this, this volume is of course bigger than this volume. It seems to, to, seems to, seems to support the big one, the strong one, supports the weak one and suppresses it. So we try to support the small one, the weak one. How do we do it? We, we give the, the weakest part in our structure the, a structural meaning. And by doing this, we, we, we get the, 
the, the same weight. So the big volume or the small volume weights the same weight like the big one, makes them floating. Equal and therefore floating. Next. We can do that in real. <laughs> we can build that as well. Uh, I'll show you one project in Vienna. Uh, before I show the project, I have to explain where it is. It is in the middle of the, of the city, of the core of the city, which is a heavily protected landmark area. That means if it's the rooftop uh, project, that, me that means when we started the project, we were not allowed, or the architects were not allowed to change anything means you are not a, you were not allowed to change the roof pitch the color the material nothing all you could do at this time was cutting out the windows next and you can see that we followed this code to the letter uh, this is of course another way another procedure which means strategy to realize things how could we do that we could Okay, we could throw it away and say this was a good idea, but we'll never get the permit. But what we did is we went to the uh, mayor of Vienna and told him, look at this model. What do you think it is? Is it architecture or art? And he said, of uh, it couldn't be architecture. It must be art. So we said, oh, yes, it is art. And how could your officials prove uh, whether this art piece follows the building codes. So he said, you are right. <laughs> so uh, this was the way we got the permit. Uh, many issues uh, were in this project. For instance, the issue of content, context. You know, context is, uh, uh, you know, this is Vitruve, Palladio, and all these old fashioned codes and rules of architecture. We thought that context is, in this way, is rather the, 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 the connection uh, of the street to the roof. Or, therefore, a, a reversed flashlight crosses the old structure. Uh, and opens it up in order to create new space. People always say that we are very aggressive. But we are not aggressive against people, we are ag aggressive against structures which prohibit us to create new one. So therefore this flesh, uh, flesh uh, destroys the old structure in order to create new space. And that makes it to a statement for a new corner solution. Uh, you know, Vienna is a very old city, and we have a lot of corner solutions. They are mainly towers. And we wanted to make a timely corner solution, a contemporary architectural corner solution, not a POMO one. Next. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the drawing. It is, it's supposed to be an office, but it could be an apartment as well. Uh, and here you see another, another game we play. This means inside-outside system. So there is a balcony, for instance, outside. And you can go in in this meeting room uh, inside. Then you go upstairs to the roof garden outside, and then you can go back to the inside as well. And there is a balcony which allows you to look along this structure. This is a nice pointer. Along this, okay, thanks. <laughs> you speed me up. Uh, this uh, structure, this reversed flashlight, is a very sophisticated structure because it's a pretense structure. It's uh, it's fixed on two one two, two parts supported by one column, and the tension comes to the structure by this uh, movable. Uh, a staircase. So, by 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 the, the the weight of the staircase gives the whole structure the tension that allows us to make it very thin and very uh, filigrane, so that we, the glass is more important than the steel in this case. 
When we showed this project in, on the MoMA show, a lot of colleagues came to us and said, nice model, <laughs> but <laughs> you will not build it. Uh, we laughed a lot because we had it next under construction at this time. And, and uh, this is the way it looks like. This is the reversed flashlight, breaking up the old structure. Of course, there are a lot of joints and links, but the new structure, which covers the meeting space, is much more important for us. Next. This is the way it looks like from inside outside. And because the, the feeling of the inside was much stronger, the view we had from this project, from the inside to the outside, was stronger than the, 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 the facade view. Therefore, the, the, the structural glazing facade arched to the outside. And this is a corner solution of the 19th century. Next. And here you can see that we didn't build a glass cupola, uh, only glass, but we played with planes and glass as well. That means that we, we are very interesting not only in blocking, uh, not only in giving the view, but also blocking the view, for instance here. That allows us, on the other hand, to play with very specific light conditions. Next. And this is the balcony, I told you. This is the, 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 the staircase, the movable staircase, uh, which leads to the uh, roof garden. And this is a very important element, because it shows that every element in our structure has not only a meaning, but is very necessary. When the client came to, 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 to the site and he saw that, he said, OK, uh, I don't like it. Uh, can you remove it? And we said, of course we can, but then the whole structure will break down. And then he said, OK, uh, I don't like how it looks like. Can we make it a little bit more valuable with kind of wood and things? Okay. And we said, OK, of course we could, but it's more expensive. Then he said, OK, leave it. <laughs> Next. <laughs> And these are the, the structural pieces in the side wings of the, of the, of the uh, rooftop, of which we structure we always use uh, in order to create space as well. Next. And this is the balcony where you can uh, uh, look from, 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 from where, you can, where you stand and look to the street along. Uh, along this stru uh, structural flesh, and it's in the inside. One other thing is important that we like transitions, that elements penetrate and going through walls, buildings, and whatever. It's not an, ac an act of aggression, once again. It's just an um, enlargement of the whole uh, space. Next. The, in, in this case, this beam creates a, a light slit where the sun, and if the sun, when the sun is shining, if the sun is shining, uh, throws an arrow of light on this wall, and in the evening the client can play sun uh, and switch on the light so the arrow goes the other way around. Next. This is, this is another secret how we design. This is the enlargement of this, the old stair uh, case. And the owner of the house wants us, wanted us to do some light uh, windows for, in, in order to, to have light there. And, and we draw it, you can see. But this was, these light slits were very boring, so I crossed it. And what you can see is that we built the correction. Next. <laughs> And this is uh, about building. This project, uh, uh, I have to be, be honest, was, was uh, built, to build this project was uh, driving in a, like driving in a Formula One racing car. A little bit more gas. <laughs> and we would have been thrown out of the curve because it was very exhausting for everyone, for the client, for, for the craftsman, for 
and for us and on the other on the other side on the other hand what else should we do if it's not exciting if it's not exhausting we better sell shoes or watches we can get more money I think so you have to have a kind of excitement going to the site seeing how the welding is going ahead and seeing how to smell the concrete where things are going up and then you can feel like the master of the universe because you are creating space this is excitement you don't get money for that but okay it's and and in this case uh, this 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 whole building site looked like the stomach of the uh, of a whale yeah? and actually uh, Moby Dick is my favorite book next and this is a story about the client and the model I still don't believe that um, this client my client our client uh, couldn't uh, could see what he will get when he saw this model uh, but uh, as you can read two years later he was stepping into his uh, office and wandering around like Alice in Wonderland next he's very proud and a good guy actually uh, and he's very proud of this project and we are very proud of this project because it's in the middle of Vienna and it showed that things can be done next another project the same time another procedure of designing a very rational one students like that more because it's easier to copy it uh, <laughs> so this is a, a factory white box no detail it, uh, we, we just uh, thought about having only three details white box and then we started to cut out and the cutout is replaced by very strange things in order to indicate where the entrance is, where the lobby is, presentation space and so forth. Next. And that's the way uh, how this concept looks in reality. A white box, almost no detail, but then it gets interesting. Next. The cutout, the, f the, the folded the folded roof, the glass corner, and as a landmark of identification, the dancing chimneys. Uh, why dancing stacks? Because <laughs> first of all, this is a this is a built answer to the question: Why do stacks always have to stay straight? Secondly, dancing chimneys. You know, this uh, this kind of figuration always changes the a angle if you walk around so it, it gives several uh, uh, views from several standpoints but you have to run around in order to see the stacks dancing next this is the the, the presentation and uh, entrance room uh, the glass corner once again a beam penetrating and open in order to open up penetrates the glass wall in order to to show that there is an inside outside next looking closer <laughs> uh, the slide shows that uh, uh, the, the, the columns happen to be in always Greek columns and <laughs> when I showed this project to uh, Rogers, Richard Rogers he asked me, he gets very nervous because he asked me how long did you did your computer work on this column and I said uh, we, we, we don't have a computer and so how long did, did you design this column and I said five minutes and he said, oh, mm. uh, I would have uh, my time for this. such a detail is about 30 hours. <laughs> See, don't trust computers. Next. <laughs> Too much. Uh, this slide shows that we don't lose the humor when we're doing bigger projects. While the, the, the whole thing was built the client wants us to, wanted us to add a partition wall between two entrances and we had no idea what we could do but when we when we walked to the site we saw that the contractor did 
a staircase completely the wrong way. So we let him remove the staircase and as you can see on the right side, I like the, yeah, this, um, we let him remove the staircase and placed it on the entrance and painted, in, uh, painted it red in order to remind him that he should read the plans of an architect more <laughs> carefully. Next. <laughs> Next, please. Our biggest project now. It's three times this factory. It's 240,000 square feet. What is it, a city? <laughs> is it a high-rise? <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a studio for an artist. It's the Kiefer Studio, which uh, is going to be built in Germany, hopefully soon. Three uh, kind of hangers. You know Anselm Kiefer? Okay, he's a, he's a very famous German painter, and, and he's not painting small paintings. He's rather painting <laughs> big paintings. He would like this space, for instance, because one of his paintings fits into this space or one sculpture. So he needs space. And uh, that we create. Next. And not only space, but also we, we, we watched him working. And he's a very interesting uh, working procedure. He's, uh, he's collecting a lot of materials in sinks, like small feathers, soil, ashes, bones, leaves, hairs, whatever he can find. It. And he has thousands of and then he's walking by and looking at these materials and then he says, okay, I take this and this and this and then he's doing his paintings. So therefore we, we made a kind of library crossing all these hangers. This is his main space. Uh, and on and, and, and this bridge, and this bridge kind um, bridge-like structure, uh, we, 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 ha we have the, we have the, the sinks uh, one after the other, and then it's, it's, it's one, one mile long and crosses all the land, and he needs a bicycle to go through. And these are hangars where, uh, where, uh, where, where the, the paintings and the sculptures are waiting to be finished, so we call it uh, waiting, we call it waiting rooms. Next. It's like uh, the doctor's thing, and, and this is his main space. Uh, where big skylights, movable skylights, allow him to let rain into the studio because he, he wants to have pools um, in his studio because he experiments with lead. Lead and water he wants to combine, means he wants to f let lead float in water. Uh, I don't know whether he uh, can succeed, but anyway, uh, it's an interesting idea to build planning mistakes because he wants to have water leaking roofs <laughs> nice you have to think about how can I make the the roof leaking where the place I have to determine so this is thinking in the reverse way it's like like the um, I always gave my son uh, uh, five dollars when he wrote an F in school uh, you know why? It was easy. When he needed money, he had to think very carefully to write an F. That means he had, has to know how it uh, goes right in order to cross the wrong um, answers. So by learning, by trials, I think it's the same uh, uh, procedure like <laughs> building planning mistakes. Next. anymore the third leg is replaced by a tension rod next that shows that it goes from static to dynamic and in this case don't be irritated this is not a uh, support it's just a fake of a support because the two legs and the third support is the third column is replaced by by tension rods almost invisible and if you, next, 
And uh, even on this, uh, this chair, the third leg is a spiral and very thin. Because we want to, actually, we want to get rid of this third column. And, and the logic way, uh, if, if you get rid of the third support, the whole structure stands up and, of course, starts to work. Next. To move. So movable architecture is getting in the, f is getting in the forefront of our uh, work in the last couple of years. This is a video pavilion in, in, in Europe. Um, and it means it's a pavilion to show video clips as art form. And we had a choice to choose which uh, video clips we would take, and we decided the theme, rock and roll, and sex and drugs. Uh, two different things. Therefore, we had to create two different uh, spatial situation. So we, uh, we designed a moving box, which this is the projection wall, which uh, opens up and closes. When, it, when it's closed, we show rock and roll. <laughs> and then we open it. Next. And this is a Japanese project where a special room uh, pops through the, uh, th through the roof in order to, to give you a, a very specific uh, overview of the city. Next. It's, uh, this is the inside and the outside of the whole thing. It's a bar building in Fukuoka. And this is the special champagne bar space you can lend. And uh, then you push the button and you pop through the roof. Next. The Japanese will like it. And this is a project which is on hold. It's on Melrose. And there is a movable, uh, there are movable parts as well because there's a, there's a restaurant, shops, and, and the art gallery. And, and this, this tower on the corner is a champagne bar, it's supposed to be a champagne bar. And we decided to design movable platform <laughs> because you more, the more you drink, the higher you will rise. I think this is a good showdown in Hollywood. Next. Power of the city. Um, this procedure I described uh, it's not only valuable for, for small architectural pieces, but you can design cities as well. Because in order to get the complexity of a city, you have to design in a very, very complex way. Actually, the additional way of thinking of the 19th century uh, did uh, uh, prove that uh, we have to throw it away. It doesn't work anymore to think that one and one is equals two. One and one could equal six as well. Who says that an architecture has to be, uh, has to follow code and rules from the ancient times? Who says that? The 19th century says it. And the, ninth, the way, which, is, which was actually a very dangerous century, because two world war were created right from the attitude of the of this century and and therefore uh, we think we have to get rid of it and we have to replace this additional simple thinking by a multi-layered way of seeing and thinking and a complex way however next to find in a city the invisible energy fields and lines is very important for us. It's not a mystery, not, not, it's not a mystery to find such things. It's not, it's not a secret. There are a lot of uh, potential uh, uh, powers invisible on, in the cities. So this, uh, this is the first model. Uh, the first model was the body language model. Uh, the model of, 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 of showing how it could be embracing a city. Uh, it was uh, the winning entry for a, a big city competition in close to Paris. Next. 
it's it, actually it's another uh, uh, lecture. But once again, you can see that we we are dealing with with the weak and the and the, and the strong elements. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Eisenman. Uh, but in another sense, I think <laughs> it's it's more. Uh, Peter is talking about this weak and strong things in the way we talk about decaf, double decaf cappuccino. <laughs> yeah, it's the most perverse thing in the world. Double decaf espresso. Yeah? It smells like espresso. It it tastes like <laughs> espresso, but it is not coffee. So this this kind of architecture is smells like architecture, looks like architecture, but it isn't architecture anyway. Uh, so. Look at that, this seemingly uh, small, low-dense structure is cutting the high-dense structure. And we anticipate that this is the place where, the point of departure, this is the place where it could happen. Because two discrepant things come together. Next. And this is a, a, a city planning project we recently won and maybe we built it, it's close, but uh, uh, the, 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 the way we designed it was very, very scientific. Uh, see, the, this is the site, it's a very large, multifunctional city center close to Vienna. And the client, it was a competition, and the client wanted to avoid these red lines because these red lines are subterranean water wells, supposedly very dangerous, or whatever. Uh, people don't feel good, they say, uh, when they live on these lines. These lines look very Himmelblau. So we thought, how can we avoid these lines and take it at the same time? So we asked the scientists how this uh, Strahlung, I don't know what this is in English, but this, uh, this, the power of these water wells uh, work. And they told us, it, you have to imagine it works like air. So what we did, we, we did a model from this land, from this site, and, and made holes along, along the, the, these red lines, put that whole thing in the box, did program, did the program out of a styrofoam in order to have it very light. And then we blew air from the, from the bottom uh, through the hole. So uh, uh, indicating that uh, the same way of uh, the, the power, the bad power is taking. And then we throw the program into the, the pieces of the program into the box. And then we looked what the, what the pieces did. They avoided, of course, the stream of air. That was so convincing <laughs> that the, the jury, which, uh, which obviously, I tell you, they were enemies of this kind of architecture, but they couldn't argue against this way of thinking. So what we did, we did a very, very rational city planning project. Next. Uh, but it turned out this way of complexity allowed us, allowed us uh, to deal a lot with, uh, um, um, how do you tell it, if, if, if it's phases, because they wanted to do it in three phases. So the combination of phase A and B, or one and three, it's easy uh, by this kind of design. It's easier, much easier, because uh, if, if it would be axial or, or, or straightforward in a kind of uh, aesthetic code, A and uh, you, you always have to go one, two, three. What we, what our design allowed to do is that we can go one, three, or one, two, or two, three, whatever the client wants. Next. So we are very obedient. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, to, to, to clients and to po politicians, I think. You have to be very obedient, otherwise you never get a thing built. <laughs> so uh, the, the main attitude of an architect is obedience. Don't forget that this 
in front of obedience. Uh, if you if you forget it, you 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 will get what you you never get what you want. Anyway, so another quote: You can't always get what you want. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, the the design deals with uh, three, uh, let's say, volumes. One is a beam; the other are slabs and uh, cubes. So cubes and, and slabs are combined in a very specific way. Next. You can see that on the, the image here, uh, the slabs are, are creating a, a spatial sequence. Next. And in the front of the, the whole uh, complex, there, there is a place, a very important square. They call it Europe Square or something like that. And every, every other architect did a high-rise right on the corner of the square here. Every, every other architect. I don't know why. What we did, we cut the high-rise in two pieces and, and placed it on top of the, of the other building in order to create the public square uh, right in the middle of the city. This public square is covered with a glass roof, which is a kind of indicates the transitional space from the public to the private space. So it's a, actually a half public space. Next, which uh, retails and things. Recent projects. Uh, um, now we are dealing with skins. I don't know why, but it it turns out that we we, we are are dealing with movable skins. This is a design for an office building. Uh, in, in Vienna as well, uh, where um, blinds and perforated sheet metal uh, uh, create a certain kind of layered skins which allows us to, to, to work with light and energy as well. Next. This is another uh, skin, skinny project. It's a kind of light tower in the middle of Vienna. Uh, it's, uh, it's showing this, uh, the, the right image is a diagram of a the, the uh, a public space at day and the, at the same place at night. It shows that it completely changes because of light. So light is one of the most powerful city planning instruments which we don't use. So in order to indicate it, we created this media tower which has next a media skin, a multi-layered skin, which gives information, any, any kind of information, from temperature to uh, real advertising, uh, um, advertising spots. Next. From, uh, from uh, news, uh, news to uh, speeches of politicians. And the square, uh, uh, the square is created by two light lines. One is the white one, and the other is a laser beam. The red one is a laser beam which goes over the square in this height and goes up into the two in, in in the space between the skins. And when people go through. The, uh, this beam, when they break the beam, the whole tower changes, of course. The light and the mood of the whole place change. So we hope that people will play and get their reaction. So this is another, this is the, the circle to the feedback machines back in the 68. Next. And cross the fingers. This is an entry for a, uh, a competition in Germany. It's a it's a multifunctional building of uh, offices and 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 apartments, retail uh, on in 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 the basement uh, with the media skin, which reflects the the activities of the inside. Uh, we'll see whether we will win it next. If not, we uh, will be very sad. Uh, that could be the, uh, the topic. This project could be the topic 
could have the topic if architecture would have a body. It would look like not architecture. Next. And in order to, to close this lecture, I choose uh, a very specific city planning project for us. It's called the dissipation of our bodies into the city. While working on these city planning projects, we started to draw on, 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 on a team photo. We draw lines without knowing what we are doing. And it turned out that uh, by using this power of the drawing, next, and creating out of the line structures, our bodies dis uh, disappeared step by step. Next. And this is the last one. The, our bodies disappeared completely and only architecture remained. Thank you very much. Take about uh, 10 minutes of questions, or Wolf will. Uh, turn up the lights. Please. It's nice to have such a shy audience. It, you, you were a great audience, I tell you. Uh, you know, if uh, you you wouldn't tell some story if the if you can't, it couldn't feel that the audience reflects what you are telling. So I think question no. This is a very American question. This is, I tell you, uh, this is a very American question because they want to put you into a, into a uh, box. Come on, there is no difference between art and architecture. If it's good art, it could be architecture. If it's good architecture, it could be art as well. If you're traveling with an airplane, are you traveling or are you, are you sitting or are you traveling? I tell you what, the, the architects, uh, uh, which always look uh, in the books uh, in order to find some Schinkel and Vitruv, is, I'm talking about European architects, of course, and they want, uh, they don't, they, they're not only draw, a drawing like, like uh, Schinkel and, and Vitruv, they even look like him. So that means going back to the 19th century, it causes a kind of virus, which is, uh, in my point of view, a very dangerous one, because it th th throws us back a lot of years. Why? I'll tell you what, the 19th century, and I'm coming out from Vienna, which is a, which is a very Freudian city, as you know, so we, we have to reflect it in a very psychological way. The 19th century, puts a heavy load on us in terms of aesthetics and as I uh, just mentioned in, a, in, in terms of way of thinking. If we can't get rid of that, we are lost because we can't solve the problems we have in this uh, ancient way. So therefore, uh, uh, there is no question for us whether we are architects or artists. Should I think something in order to close? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>